Hi everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation, and today I've got my favourite guest back, Reed Little from The Contrarians. How are you, mate? Doing great, Peter. Thank you for inviting me. Been looking forward to this show like always. Absolutely. Today we are going to go back to the early 80s and David Bowie Let's Dance. So our discussion today is to basically cover the tracks, what we like, what we don't like. This was David Bowie's most popular album. I think uh, even today it may be maybe behind The Spiders of Mars, uh, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust is the number one. No, you're shaking no, your no, head. No. Yeah, I mean, possibly internationally. I, have not I was saying internationally. internationally. Yeah, internationally. Yeah. But certainly in the US, uh, Let's Dance is by a very wide margin his most popular album. Yeah, this was a top five album in the US. It was David Bowie's first number one single with Let's Dance, the uh, the title track. It was basically a cultural phenomenon in the day. He had all his clips with MTV were played to death around 83, 84. So start it off, Reid. What do you think of Let's Dance, the album? Okay, so let's dance. I can never remember now whether the first David Bowie I ever saw was Ashes to Ashes or Let's Dance. It was it was on MTV, so it was one of the big videos. Mm -hmm. And it was probably Ashes to Ashes, but that didn't make an impression on me at the time. Let's Dance did. Let's Dance, China Girl, and Modern Love were in heavy rotation, and I really enjoyed all of those songs. Um, and I actually did not hear the full album until much, much later. In fact, 2012. So 30 years after this album came out. Um, it was a fascinating time in Bowie's life. Now, famously, he had one of the world's worst contracts with his old manager, Tony DeFries, where Tony DeFries created this production company, Main Man Productions, and David Bowie thought he owned 50% of Main Man Productions. He didn't. He owned 0% of Main Man Productions, and Tony DeFries owned 50% of David Bowie. So David Bowie totally financed everything that Main Man Productions did without Bowie getting a cent in return. So this guy just siphoned off David's money until 1982. So Everything he earned in the 70s went to Tony DeFries functionally. So he finally, he took him to court. They fought and fought and they had a deal that uh, it ended his relationship with Tony DeFries in 1982. So at that point, Bowie jumps ship and he records Let's Dance. So you're talking about a guy who has had massive selling albums, huge tours, not making a penny. So he decides, this is it. I'm, I need some hits because this functionally, this one album was making up for 10 years of career that he didn't get paid for. And he makes the really weird choice to hire Nile Rodgers. And some of this stuff, I always say, as, as an old guy looking at this, you can remember a bit of the history. If, if you did not experience the 80s, you start to think that the 80s were all just one big monolithic unit, right? It's, it's like whatever you saw on Stranger Things. Well, that's not what the 80s was like. And Chic, Nile Rodgers' band, they were huge in disco. They were dead as a commercial force in 1982. Correct. The Let's Dance was recorded late 1982, early 1983. Dead. Yes. So the fact that David Bowie went to Nile Rodgers, who was functionally over as a uh, not as as a producer, but as a musician and went to him and said, you can produce a hit record for me. That's absolutely amazing. Um, mm. And to have been correct, because um, Nile Rodgers says, you know, Bowie played him some examples of songs. Bowie had the lyrics but he didn't have any of the music. Uh, Nile Rodgers created most of the music for the album. And it starts right off with um, Modern Love, which is an absolutely fantastic song. And that opening, that 
dude, it's so iconic. And it's, it immediately grabs your ear and you're like, Oh, what is this? Um, and then the music of that song, I was, I was listening to it again today before we did this. The music is so simple. There's so little going on. And that's true for most of the album compared to everything that Bowie had ever recorded, which was very complicated. This album is so stripped back. It's drums, it's bass. And then on top of that, you have a little bit of guitar and uh, you have saxophone and trumpet. And on Modern Love, especially the sax and the trumpet are supplying most of, of the melody music. And then you have David Bowie singing like it's the 1960s because he really wanted to recapture like Motown. But he still comes up with these weird lyrics. And that's the thing about when you talk about it's David Bowie's most commercial album. And this is a, a theme that'll go on through the whole album. Yeah. It's commercial now because it sold a lot of copies. But if you read the lyrics to Modern Love, it's all of David Bowie's usual themes about his alienation for religion, yes. his fear of death. Social commentary. Uh, yes. Yeah. 100%. So it's just as weird as always, but in a much catchier musical framework. Yeah, I, I agree with your take on that. So just a couple of things. With Niall Rogers, I, just with his production credits prior to this album, he did the Diana solo album in 1980 which was a uber hit so upside right. down which you, you're familiar that was played all around the world i think that was a number one album for diana and then he did the deborah harry um solo album coco which bombed so noel rogers probably uh cemented his production kudos out of this album Right. And it is a very slick and sparkly production all the way through. So I think Bowie to choose Noel Rogers, and it doesn't hurt that you've you've got Tony Thompson playing the drums from Chic. You've got the right. you know two of the the Chic members playing on this album to have that really radio friendly American orientated you know open arms album for radio FM AM, call it what you will. So musically, I agree with everything you say. It, it's uh, all of the avant-garde musical tendencies of Bowie in that previous decade have been smoothed out. So definitely it's got that slick dance groove feel to it. And I think the, uh, the Nile Rogers production it definitely uh, paves the way for this to be a massive hit modern love i love that intro with that that guitar effect i've always you know you can see why that was a um a huge hit so right. i mean another thing about this album is uh and i've spoken about this previously there was a tendency in the 80s that you would load all the hits in the first side of an album it all be right. stacked up so there are only eight tracks on this album reed and for side one modern love China Girl, Let's Dance, one, two, three. Three singles all went top top ten. And one of one of the three went to number one. And then the fourth single, which was uh, we'll talk about later, which was the second last song with uh, cat um people putting out the fire. So top loading, all of the, the singles, all the radio singles in the first side of the album, and that was the tendency that they used to do in the eighties. Yes. Uh and I think I don't know, as, as uh, listening to it much later as a fan, I do wish they had resequenced it a little bit because the album is so top heavy. Uh, also, and, and I'm sure this will be again a theme as we go and discuss the other songs, but you can tell how much effort Nile Rodgers put into each song, right? So these first three songs are immaculately produced. They're immaculately arranged. Bowie's not playing any of the instruments. It's the first album in his career where he doesn't play a single instrument. And according to Nile Rogers, Bowie just left him alone. He was like, here's my lyrics. Here's a basic arrangement. Now it's up to you to, to turn this, you know, to, uh, I'll, I'll be polite and say, turn this sow's ear into a silk purse. 
And uh, the fact that Rogers was able to do that is just absolutely astounding. Now, one thing that I, again, a historical note that might get lost because again, talking about this is David Bowie's most commercial album. It's his most commercial album. You'll hear that over and over and over again. There was nothing that sounded like this album in 1983. There was nothing that sounded like it. Disco was dead. Synth pop I mean, was, uh, you had the new romantic, you had the synth right? pop. And, you know, okay. uh, there's some conjecture that Bowie probably invented a little bit of new romantic movement yeah. when you look at the Ashes to Ashes clip of the uh, um, the Scary Monsters. That, that album probably invented that genre of music. And there was a British invasion. Yes. And music in that era was very in the synth pop, new romantic. And this, and this was, album is, funky. is nothing like that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing now, of course, famously, this is Stevie Ray Vaughan's premiere on the world stage. Um, and Stevie Ray Vaughan became so legendary that it's easy to remember that Stevie Ray Vaughan was nobody. He was utterly and completely unknown unless you lived in Austin, Texas. You've, you've stolen my thunder because um, I was going to talk about him in a certain song. But uh, yes, his playing is sublime all across this record. Even the non-single um, songs, it's right. just his, his guitar, the tonality of his playing just cuts through. And you could see that uh, people, you know, were you could see how he became a star. This, this album not only made David bowie more of a star because he he was basically he had top 10 songs in america he was a draw card he rose to another level he was a Absolutely. superstar and through the curtails of david bowie stevie ray vaughan became a star out of this album because his playing is 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 quite sublime and uh, I guess I'll, I'll hit more on Stevie as we go to the next songs because he doesn't yep. actually play on Modern Love. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. But um, so Modern Love, and I love the lyrics, um, you know, basically never going to fall for Modern Love walks beside me. Modern Love walks on by Modern Love gets me to the church on time. I love it. I just, yeah. I, yeah, I just he, love he doesn't understand modern love. It makes him want to find religion, but you know what? He doesn't like religion either. Yeah. So. That's one of Bowie's themes. He's like, yeah, I, I'm religiously curious, but I don't think it has the answers. He says it much more poetically than I do. Absolutely. So the, the next one is China Girl, and he basically uh, leans on an old friend, Iggy. So that's a co-write. So yeah. Iggy did this uh, song earlier in one of his uh, solo albums. I like both versions, but this is definitely a much slicker version. What, what right. do you think of China Girl? So what a weird track. And um, again, let's talk about historical, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of historical context, especially since I think that as you know, persons of a certain age, that's a service we can provide to our younger viewers. Uh, but there was a time when you could sit there and watch an album or a song like China Girl in this this uh, very famous video recreating the love scene from From Here to Eternity, which parts of it were censored because I think it shows David's butt or something. Um, but in any case, um, you could actually watch that and there were no racist overtones to it that most people would get. And now you listen to it and you're like, Holy cats, this is the most racist song I've ever heard. And it is because it's about Iggy Pop's obsession with this Vietnamese model <laughs> that he was dating. So just starting with the fact that it's really a Vietnamese woman and he writes this song about China girl. I mean, that's kind of hinky, right? Uh, and David Bowie did co-write the original. But yeah, the two tracks, the original on uh, The Idiot and this version on let's dance could not be more different and the fact that again this is now rogers doing all of the music so david brings in this iggy pop song and says here turn this bizarre angry racist anthem about i'm you know don't make me mad i control everything about your life 
and turn it into a dance hit. And he did. Well, I've got a, an interesting take on this. Niall Rogers, when he first heard this song, had a different interpretation because he didn't know the background of the song. And he assumed that the song was actually about drugs. The China doll was a reference to Coke. Um, it was more of a drug analogy. And he approached um, the production and the instrumentation of his song as more of a pop vehicle, which is completely different to how um, Iggy did it um, in that, right. you know, the mid seventies. So it's interesting. And, and Bowie loved the irony of how Niall Rogers approached this song based on his interpretation of the lyrics. But yeah, look, that was uh, filmed in Sydney, very controversial. Um, it did get censored with MTV. Bowie was living in Sydney for a period of time and um, did a lot of, of those film clips um, from Australia. We'll talk more about Let's Dance shortly. Uh, and, um, yeah, look, a lot of those uh, sort of MTV clips were groundbreaking. They were well filmed. They were like little mini movie productions. I think Bowie probably took it a little bit too far with the MTV movie production with the Tonight album. I'll talk about that shortly but um yeah i think it's uh it's a it's a fine clip and yeah it does it, it is a, a homage to to from here to eternity and uh i think he, he actually had a relationship with that girl for a period of time they were very close and um, much too close for the the, the mtv senses i'm not sure right. if it got banned in a, in australia but it, it got banned in america or it, it got censored in america it, it just got censored and yeah. in fact you still cannot get the uncensored version like um there's a um a, a collection of of all of david bowie's videos that came out yeah I've got uh, i can't that. i've got it yeah. sitting on the shelf over here i can't remember what it's called um and it's got the censored version of it yeah. you just can't find the uncensored version in the u.s yeah. at all yeah i think it's a very central song um even though it's poppy and glossy but i think it's kind of sexy it's it's sensual and there's got that little bit of a groove and the way that bowie's you know sort of doing the shh and the um, yeah, there's. I think it, it brings out the emotional, sensual side of Bowie, and it comes right. out in spades. And I can easily see it, why it uh, became a hit. So it's the the lyrics in it are so much more Iggy than they are Bowie. Yeah. Um, because you know Bowie, I have read now. I've I've read, geez, half a dozen books about David Bowie, and Bowie was apparently very non-confrontational his whole life. Like whenever he would fire a band member, he would send them a letter and the letter would just say, your services are no longer required. You one know, se one people sentence did, was it one sentence? Yeah, that was, that was it. Uh, people did not talk to David. They had to talk to Coco, his assistant, because David was not going to get into a confrontation with anybody. Uh, so David Bowie was not going to write a lyric about how he was dominating this woman's life. That just was not David Bowie. That was pure Iggy. But something about that clearly appealed to him. Isn't it funny that um, David Bowie's not a very confrontational per, um, person, but the album cover, he's got, he's got his jukes up. And we've spoken about this before. It's like, yeah. a, you know, a letter of intent, you know, he's got the jukes up. And I know boxing, there's an analogy between boxing and dancing because, it, you know, it's there's a lot of, uh, you know, steps and movements and all that right. sort of jazz. By but, the way, uh, kids, if you don't know what that is, I'll hold that album up again for a second, please. If you're not familiar with it, those numbers on the album sleeve, that's a dance chart that tells you where to put your feet on certain beats. Yeah. Most people have probably never seen one of those. It went out of style in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, Reed, and did that both album cover get ripped off by Peter Wolf? Because I seem to have in my brain that there's this Peter Wolf album that looked exactly like that with little numbers. I don't know. One of the viewers will correct me you, you i mean you're asking the wrong guy about peter wolf now i do know that bowie was boxing uh shadow boxing uh to get into shape for this tour so that may just have been a uh, part of that but again i say you know david bowie was tall uh but he was about this big around and uh he's not a particularly physically imposing presence even with his dukes up Love that I, album cover, though. It's iconic. It is absolutely iconic. Um, yeah, it's part of pop culture. And um, 
there's the back cover. That's very 80s. It's got that 80s sort of feel about it. But uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sort of pastels and neon. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, great album cover. So that's China Girl. So that's hit two. And then we've got the big Mount Everest on this album, which is uh, Let's Dance. And you know what? This is, it's now. So I was trying to find my source on this again, and I, I couldn't find it real quick just before the show, but I think it's his second most popular song in the download age. Um, Space Oddity is number one, and Let's Dance is number two. Uh, and for years and years, Let's Dance was number one. And doggone it, it deserves it. It is such a good song. It's so catchy. It is. And again, I want to get back to the idea that because it was a big commercial hit, people say, oh, well, this was David Bowie selling out. There was nothing that sounded like this type of music. Nothing. And the fact that David Bowie, now again, Stevie Ray Vaughan went on to be a legend. And the fact that he died young before he could make any crap albums, you know, just made his, his legend that much bigger, right? But blues was dead as a commercial force in the United States in the early 80s. Nobody was listening to blues except for, you know, I mean, there's always like a small cadre of blues fans, right? But it was very, very much a niche. Um, so the idea of taking dance music and adding blues guitar, it's nearly impossible to describe 40 years later just how strange an idea that was. And the fact that it worked is absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's, it's you, majestic solo. It just cuts through. And, you know, the, as I said earlier, the tone of his, uh, of the guitar lead break in this song is just magnificent. And uh, a legend was born. And for Bowie to think outside the square and be, you know, because he is an innovator. And as you said, bring in a, a blues guitarist. They probably had a lot of a local following, bit of a cult hero, and bring him into this uh, um, this album to the masses is just uh, you know, you know that's that just shows that the 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 genius of Bowie. So and now growing up listening to functionally the radio versions of these songs, right? The the radio version of Let's Dance is three minutes something. The album version of Let's Dance is seven minutes. And finally getting to listen to the album after 30 years was a revelation because what they cut out was Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, in the, in the soul or in the, uh, the radio edit, the, the solo is not even a full bar of music. It's there's so little guitar in it. But the video clip does have it because David Bowie's on the top of the cliff and he's playing the guitar with these uh, white gloves, right. which I thought was a little bit, uh, not sure, but um, yeah, but the 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 video clip definitely had the guitar solo. You you and I still have to give so much credit to Nile Rodgers because Bowie is still and it, it just it kills me to read about how oh you know David Bowie was was not creative and blah 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 on this album and he was selling out and I was like okay he literally was selling out because he wanted to get a paycheck after 10 years of, of but he didn't giving sell all it, of his money. But he didn't sell right. his soul sort of no, artistically. He is, still, he is absolutely still David Bowie. He just is David Bowie on top of this wonderful pop construction. And the fact that that worked is Nile Rogers. Yeah. Although you still have to give Bowie credit for, just the vocals and from what i've read he did his vocals in two days for this entire album and they're phenomenal uh bowie yeah. was always an amazing singer yeah one thing i like about let's dance is the intro it kind of builds up <laughs> you know like the uh yeah you've got this build up and i love the um the sax in, the, in this, right. uh, you know, these little sax stabs. It's just perfectly sort of uh, the instrumentation, the arrangement is just perfect. And uh, as I said, you can understand why Nile Rogers was the producer of choice after this. I think Duran Duran and yeah, so many major artists were were looking down uh, Nile Rogers' phone number after this album. Yes, so. but I just keep thinking this album is so creative. 
It's so creative from start to finish. And yet all it gets referred to is, oh, oh it was when Bowie sold out and produced his commercial album. No, yeah. the, the commerciality was a result of people loving the product and buying it, not because they were producing you know, music that wasn't worthy of David Bowie's name. I would say to those guys, look at the lyric sheet, read it. Is this something, this is, you know, they're thoughtful, it's got depth. Um, as I said, it it does a lot of themes that are outside the, the normal wheelhouse of what you would expect a, an 80s pop album. So, right. And all right. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, he's, he's magnificent. He really is on this album. Um, without you, what's your views on this one? This is probably, to me, the lesser of any of the tracks on the whole album. I don't know what your views are. So I've recently had a change of heart about this song. Um, I always considered the middle tracks in this album. Um, well, we'll, we'll get to the others, but the, without you ended side one. And I, I think it, I mean, it's clearly the worst song on side one. Nothing was going to match up to those first three. One, two, three. And it was released as a single. Um, it didn't do nearly as well. I think it made like number 78 on the US charts. So a huge drop off. But when I listen to it now, I think, you know what? That's, it's not a bad song. It's just, uh, it suffers because it's an okay song as opposed to one of the first three <laughs> juggernauts. But In the shadows. My opinion is, without you sets the tone for David Bowie going forward. There is nothing on tonight or never let me down or most importantly, the labyrinth soundtrack that sounds anything like modern love, China girl, or let's dance. But tonight never let me down. And the labyrinth soundtrack sound a lot like without you. So this actually set the template for Bowie for the next six years almost mm. before he joined Tin Machine. So it's not a bad song. It's not as good. Um, and in the hands of worse producers, like he would work with on Tonight and Never Let Me Down, he gets worse results with the material. But yeah, now I take. think it's just fine. Yeah. Interesting take. Yeah. All right. Ricochet. I don't mind this. What's your views on this song? Um, Interesting lyrics, social commentary. It, it is the most Bowie. Uh, it's the, it, there's the least Nile Rogers in Ricochet, I think, of, of any of the songs. Mm. I, uh, so... I think it's, it does have the most Bowie-esque lyrics. The opening part of the song doesn't really grab me, but I think the ending of it, where they come in with Stevie Ray Vaughan's solo, he's got that extended outro solo that's just sublime. Yeah, that really I, saves that track for me. Yeah, I think it does. It just pushes it up to another level. But uh, the lyrics on this are really interesting, and it's sort of like um, sort of political prisoners overseas, social commentary. Right. Um, yeah. As I said, it's a Trojan horse. Um, you think this album is like a pop confection, but um, people in the clubs in New York, the two cool for school type, um, you know, types dancing away and they're just dancing to a lot of um, lyrical content that is quite deep and very much social commentary like ric Ricochet. Um, yeah, I think, I think lyrically, this is probably one of his best, probably one of the best songs on the album from a lyrical perspective. It definitely harks back to, uh, the lyrics on, um, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. He's got another song about political prisoners on that album called Scream Like a Baby. So that was a theme that was definitely in his head. And I think he carried that forward into this song. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What do you think of Criminal World? So, uh, interesting song. Um, 
it's a, um, I was not aware for years and years that it was a cover tune. One thing about Bowie has done a lot of covers in his time and the covers he does sound like David Bowie songs, uh, which I think is the way to do a cover, right? If you're just going to sound exactly like the artist who did it, then what's the point? It's redundant. Uh, my wife actually feels the other way. She likes the, likes it when people basically cover a song and sound exactly the same. And I'm like, I don't, I don't really get that, but okay. You know, different strokes. Um, and I think it's, again, it's a good song. I think if it had been on a different album, it would, it would fare better. If he had put it on tonight, it would have been an, a, a standout track. Yes. On this album, it just feels overwhelmed by the other songs. I would prefer to hear this on tonight than God Only Knows. I think butchering most of that, that song. Yes. <laughs> I think we've got a tonight episode probably uh, in the bag, you and I, but um, it might become uh, ultimately quite depressing. But anyway, that's for another day. Right. Criminal World. Cat People. I love this song. I love this song. I love this I song. I love this song. It's, it's the vocal. The vocal delivery absolutely sells this one for me. I yeah. don't even know what the, the lyric is about. I know it was the theme song for the movie. The Cat People. Uh, in a different... In a different version. I love the lyric, putting out fire with gasoline. It's just... Yeah. Um, I debate it in... The, in I, I sort of debate whether I like the um, the Giorgio Moroda um, film version, which is much more orchestral and it slows it down a little bit and it's got more of a backup singer uh, vibe to it. Or this version right. where you've got Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitars all the way through. I think it's like um, I'm, I'm conflicted whether I like one um, from the other. I know the Georgie Moroda soundtrack version went top 10 in these waters. I'm not sure in America. It, it was it was not that popular here. But um, I do. I like the, the, the Let's Dance version of it better. And uh, it's, again, because of that combination of Stevie Ray Vaughan's guitar and I, I love David Bowie's delivery of the, every time he putting out the fire with gasoline, it, just the way he sells that is awesome. Yes, that was well done, Reed. That was. Well oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, as I said, I like both versions, but uh, the 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 film soundtrack version um, was a huge hit over here. Went top ten. Um, Interesting. And. When I heard this version on the album, I was a little bit disappointed, but now it's sort of um, caught up. And the reason why it's caught up is Stevie Ray Vaughan's uh, guitars uh, are just all over it. Uh, it's, it's a great song. Um, and then you've got the finale, which is Shake It. What do you think of that? I, I, okay, so for me, Shake It's the worst song on the album. Really? Um, okay. It's... It's one of those that as soon as the, the sound of it dies off, I forget what I just listened to. There is nothing in the song that draws my ear. There's nothing that sticks with me. It's just there and, and done. Um, I could have replaced that song with almost anything else and it would have had, you know, the same or similar effect. So it, the, the end of the album is the place to put it, you know, <laughs> so uh yeah it just i'm not i'm not into it yeah it's a bit harsh i like it um i don't think it's that bad um is it uh do you think well isn't it funny it's only eight tracks on this album so right. four singles and then you've got ready side b b side so um i i assumed that shake it was a b side to one of the the four um singles i guess the very, or did you say in, there in were America? five there were five singles uh, well, uh, if you count um, putting out the fire, there were five. The Cat People. So I don't think he released Cat People as a single in the U.S. It was released as a single internationally. Really? Okay. But in the U.S., they just released Side One uh, yep. as individual singles. Right. Okay. Well, there's the album. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, you can sort of understand why it was his biggest selling album. In, in America, it, it was definitely made for that um, that market. Then he did the Serious Moonlight tour, 
which was uh, phenomenally popular, uh, toured the world. Then he had a break and he did Tonight. And that sort of, um, yeah, just didn't do as well. Do you think when he was, I know we'll probably do another show about Tonight, but do you think he was trying to do a Let's Dance Part 2 with Tonight? Yeah, you you really wonder what happened to all of his fantastic instincts. Because again, Let's Dance is just the album where David did everything right. You know, hiring Nile Rodgers. And even Nile Rodgers says, you know what? He could have had any producer he wanted. Um, and, um, oh, I'm uh, Quincy. He could have had Quincy, who was producing like Michael Jackson and, and these you know, massive, massive albums. And uh, he didn't. He called this guy who hadn't had a hit for a couple of years and told him, you can take my music and make hits out of it. And he was right. You know, he brings in this unknown uh, blues guitarist to add to dance music. No one was listening to blues, let alone adding it to dance music. And he was right. Um, you know, he put a lot of money into videos at a time when MTV was starting to become the dominant music distribution in the United States. And he was right. They loved his videos and they played him constantly. And then all of those instincts just deserted him for tonight, even though the tonight was a hit and blue jean was a hit um, yep yeah i think modest I, I think the thing that put the right was blue jean the, the song it's okay but the padding um doing a 30 minute movie oh, um gosh. was just super self indulgent and i really think that uh the audience just lost interest um if perhaps if they chose a different song, maybe if they did Loving the Alien, Loving the Alien to me is um, by a country mile the best song on the album. Maybe if they chose yeah. that as a single and they had a snappy um, film clip, but just doing that indulgent um, blue jean film clip. And it's not a very good film clip. It's not a very good movie where you've got uh, David Bowie as a, and he's, you know, he's a doper ganger for the, the, the person, another David Bowie guy. Right. It's just a very boring film. It, it is. And it, well, of course, that followed Michael Jackson's Thriller, which was the first long form video. And everybody loved that video so much that if you were, you know, the higher echelon star, then you had to do a long form video. So Bowie did Blue Jean. And yeah, when I was in high school and that came on, I was like, what am I watching? Because it's, 25 minutes before they get to the song something like that and it's just painful it is um i think i think that contributed to um yeah uh, this album tanking and it's um there are a lot of legends about stevie ray vaughn's the termination of his involvement with david bowie and of course, to begin with, that was probably a terrible, terrible thing for Stevie, but he milked it and turned that into massive street cred, right? Because if you read uh, interviews with Stevie Ray Vaughan later, he was like, oh yeah, they were trying to get me to do choreography and they kept adding shows and weren't paying me any more money. And I just told him to hit the road. And uh, Carlos Alomar says that is not anywhere close to what actually happened. Um, and he also said that they were making like four figures a week, which you figure for, you know, a touring musician in the early 80s, $4,000 a month would have been massive wages. But um, the latest story, I read a book. Uh, oh, my gosh. And the title is escaping me. But it's, it's this huge biography of, of David Bowie by Peg, I believe, P-E-G-G. And uh, he said that basically while they were on their way to Europe to rehearse for the tour, Stevie Ray Vaughan's manager called David Bowie and said, if you don't give Stevie X amount more money, he's not doing the tour. And again, Bowie is Mr. Non-Confrontational. So Bowie wouldn't, Bowie wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't talk to the guy. And apparently he was, he just didn't know what to do. And the tour promoter said, well, I'm not ponying up another dime for this tour. And just like that, Stevie was out of the band. And um, 
there's uh, quotes from other guys in the band saying we literally left him at the plane station. He was standing there with his guitar case as we were loading onto the planes to go to Europe. And they don't think Stevie knew what was going on. Like his manager just did it, or maybe his manager told him, Hey, don't worry. There's no way that they're going to, you know, bring in somebody else at the last second, but that's what happened. Stevie's out. Uh, they bring in um, Earl Slick to do the tour. Earl Slick is, is actually a fine guitar player. Oh, but he's no Ray Vaughan. Yeah, he's not, but he's a great guitarist. Gee, Bowie's had some great guitarists. I he's mean, got you know, an Mick eye for Ronson talent. and, you know, just going back the lineage of all the guitarists that have been um, played with Bowie have been fantastic. But um, for me, but then- Stevie Ray is right up there because there's so much cut through in this album. Yes. And, and, but then is. Stevie takes that personal failure and that launches his career. You know, he's the guy who turned down David Bowie. Uh, and that all of a sudden he puts out Texas Flood, which to me, and, and I know blues fans will argue, but I think Texas Flood's the best American blues album ever. Um, we could do a different show on that someday. I mean, I'm not a huge blues aficionado, so it's not like I've got yeah. a huge uh uh stake in this fight but i love texas flood i think that is an amazing album yeah look it certainly is and that'll be for another show well thanks for this read this is uh really good it's look um i love bowie i could talk uh cover all these albums because i I just love him to bits and uh, let's dance is probably one of my favorite um you know 1980s albums of uh, david bowie and um yeah it was a fun chatting and doing a bit of a deep dive on each of the tracks so please subscribe to rock daydream nation like put your comments what you think you know agree with any of uh, our commentary and we will do a show very shortly see you later thanks peter